this is uh, another CBMM virtual meeting. And uh, uh, through Zoom and the internet, we have the opportunity to see people who are sometimes too far away or difficult to reach. In this case, um, all the CBMM alumni, Youssef was uh, um, at MIT. He got his uh, PhD in 2015 formally supervised by me in practice by Lorenzo Rosasco. I kind of regret not having spent enough time with him because he did and is doing great work and you will hear from him about Sobolev independence criteria. Yeah, thanks so much. Tommy. Thank you so much, Tommy, for the introduction <coughs> and thank you for <coughs> the invitation and thanks also to Hector and Gabby. <coughs> So we, I will be talking today about uh, Sobolev and uh, Independence Criterion. <clears throat> and it's a method for nonlinear feature selection where we are also caring about doing false discovery rate control. So this is joint work with a bunch of colleagues from IBM and ex-IBX colleagues in IBM, Tom Sercu, Mattia Rigotti, Inkit Padhi, and Cicero Dos Santos. Uh, I will start first of all by presenting some motivation, then I will delve a little bit into the details about what do we mean by feature selection and false discovery rate controls. And I will tell you about the method that we, most of us know from lasso to elastic net to random forest that are uh, used <coughs> in feature selection, especially in bioinformatics and biology. Then I'll be presenting our method that is called Sobolev Independence Criterion and how it relates to nonlinear sparsity. And then I will show how do we use our criterion to do false discovery control uh, using as well generative models and something called hold out randomization tests. And I will finish with some experiments. So let's start with some motivation. So, <clears throat> so the, the motivation is that once we wanna like this is do scientific discovery, things may go wrong. For example, if we only care about simple correlation, you may, you may end up with those kind of headlines in certain newspaper that spaghetti sauce and pizza fight cancer. So in a sense that if you see only some superior correlation without like <clears throat> making controls for false discovery, things may go wrong. And another example of this is that uh, a crisis of reproducibility that has been seen more recently in uh, all uh, uh, science domains, which is that if you repeat an experiment another time, most of the time the results are not, are not correct. And this was, uh, for example, in uh, biology, this was a, a big replica uh, then conducted in Germany that showed that um, many of those replica leads to, to that, that there are false discoveries. And another case is that in, uh, in most of the studies for, uh, as uh, this is now of, uh, uh, like by the FDA to, to do the control for failure or acceptance for a, uh, a drug, most of them also are failing. So in a sense, once we are doing all of those discoveries, it's important to control for false discoveries and to keep some uh, power, which is the true positive rate. So it's, it's, a, it's this tension that we know in terms like if you are in computer vision, precision recall or true positive rate versus the false uh, discovery rate. So the, just to set the stage, so we, the data that we will be talking about is in this form. So we have a bunch of individuals, right? So uh, this is uh, on, the, on, the, on the rows and on the columns, we have a bunch of features. Think of them as being some genomic features, for example. And then we have a response for each individual, like with its genomic feature, we have a response Y, that is the presence of an app or absence of a disease. And what we wanna see is that this response depends only on few of the features in the population. And we wanna know which are those features that are important to predict the, to predict the, the response. So it's kind of very uh, old fashioned uh, feature selection problem. So what we, let's just put things formally. So what we have, we have a, a vector X. This is what, uh, for example, the genomic features and we have a response Y that is the disease. And our goal is to find a subset of feature S such as that the complement of S, if I restrict my X to the complement, it's independent of the response conditionally on all the other features. So I wanna find which are the features that are responsible of this response. 
this S is usually referred as uh, the Markov blanket. And our goal in finding this S is, as I was saying, is to maintain a high true positive rate. And true positive rate is like if I give you a candidate set, I want it to be intersecting the, the, the correct set S of features. Uh, and I want to control the false discovery rate. I want to avoid being in the complement, right? The, like uh, in the complement of, uh, of the correct set. So what, what do we know about this and how this has been uh, solved in the past? So, so typically people tend to solve via, via the, via the so-called uh, lasso and or uh, elastic net that are fitting a linear predictor, right? The beta is just a linear predictor on your data X and Y is the response. So Y now here is a matrix and X is a big matrix of all the data point and beta is a linear predictor. And typically you want this beta to have the, uh, to control like how many are active in the beta, right? How many are non-zeros and usually use the L0 norm. And typically this is relaxed via some convex relaxation to an L1 or a mixture of L1 and L2. And when you mix L1 and L2, it's called elastic net. So adding the L2 term is usually enhances the stability of the method in this case when we do L1. So typically, how do we do the feature selection after we solve this? Then we get the linear predictor. We sort the, the, the absolute values of the beta j. And then we use this as a statistics to say if a feature is important or not. The caveat of this method is that it is linear, right? It will not account to any nonlinear dependency between y and x. Even though this method is still like very widely used in uh, many, many uh, science domains that uh, uh, we know very well how to cross validate the values of lambda and lambda two. So everything is, uh, there is a lot of packages that can handle this. So it's, uh, this method is, is still very widely used, although it has this limitation of, um, of, of being only capable to do linear predictors. Another very popular method, it's uh, due to Leo Brayman, it's uh, random forest. So in random forest, the typical approach is that you will consider your data set of uh, features and responses, and you will fit many decision trees. And then you will uh, aggregate all those decision trees to become your random forest. And uh, Leo Brayman actually in his, uh, in his uh, paper where he introduced random forest in introduced feature importance scores via, via those decision trees. And the way those feature importance are computed, they are computed by looking how many times in those trees a feature has been visited. So this is kind of like on average, if a feature was visited many times in the, in the decision tree, it means it is important. Although this is not backed with, with uh, theory, random forests have the, the, the capability of, uh, uh, I'm just talking about the feature importance, it's not backed with theory. So the, uh, the random forests have a very good capability of fitting uh, uh, nonlinear uh, dependencies between X and Y, and it's very widely used in all, the, uh, in all domains where we need and we care about interpretability and feature importance scores such as bioinformatics. So now, uh, now that we, we, we talked about what are the methods that are present in the literature, we will start now to revisit how we think about feature selection from a information theoretic point of view. So let me first describe what is, how we will, will, how we'll revisit this problem, this very old problem. So the way we will think about it, we'll think is, I will start just setting the stage first to say what, how to, do we define distances between distributions <clears throat> using, uh, using, uh, uh, <clears throat> using super problems, okay? <clears throat> so the, we'll define a variational distance between uh, a distribution P and a distribution Q by defining a function F that has high values on the support of P and low values on the support of Q. So this is the soup of F in F. I take the expectation over F uh, uh, over P minus the expectation over F for uh, Q. So this is, if you think about it, this is just a function. They usually refer to it a witness function that's telling like, can I tell apart P from Q, right? It's, it's a classifier if you, if you want between P and the Q. 
So those type of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of distances between distribution are called integral probability metrics. Integral because in the, in the objective, there is an integral and you're integrating over those uh, distributions. They are called integral probability metric. And in this family, there is so many, so many distances. And the distance defined is determined by the choice of the function class F. So since now we are in CBMM, we'll go talk first about LKHS. If we are in LKHS, then this distance, it's called the maximum mean discrepancy. And if the kernel was universal, it defines really a good distance between distributions. Now back to our problem. So what does mean mutual information? So the mutual information, we know that it is the distance between the joint distribution of the, the genomic features and the response versus the product of marginals, right? So seeing the joint distribution, how reality is, right? Of how the features are and with their responses together versus a scrambled view of the reality. I take a genomic feature and I assign to it a random uh, response, right? So the, K, the mutual information as it is defined usually, it's just the KL distance between the joint and the product of margins. Issue with KL is that uh, with high dimensional data, it's not easy to estimate. So we will not, we'll define our mutual information now via this uh, integral probability metric by just saying, instead of P and the Q, I will put the joint distribution and the Q, it will be the product of margins. So do, do we have so far any question? Okay. Oh, well, okay. okay. So how do, we do, how do we do feature selection within this point of view? So within this point of view, feature selection becomes, I want to find a gate W, right? Such as that if I gate my input X, right? I maintain maximum mutual information, right? So I, remember now I'm putting D of P, X, Y, this is the joint, comma, P, X, P, Y. But what I did here, I gated X, right? I'm, I'm putting a gate W and I'm asking this gate to have SL0 norm. So in a sense, I'm, I'm trying to zero out many of the features. I wanna see up, up, up until when I can keep my mutual information maximum. So this is the, the point of the mutual, uh, the, sorry, the information theoretic point of view of feature selection. It is to find a gate such that if I mask some features, I'm, I'm still maintaining very high, so that's a soup. Uh, so now let's, let's expand what's going on inside this because D is also a soup, right? So we have a soup over the gate, soup over the classifier between the joint and the product of the marginals. So now if we just think about it, so this soup over W and soup over F can be absorbed in one soup, right? It can, because it's still on the function class F. But all what we are asking, we are asking our derivatives with respect to the input xj to be sparse. So in a sense, instead of writing this difficult problem where I want to learn a function and a gate, I could learn it as learning one function and controlling my gradients to be sparse, my gradient with respect to the input, which is like, which is now becomes obvious when you think about it. We always do it in those attention or saliency based method, right? We look at the gradient of the function with respect to the input to get a sense if this feature is important or not. But usually we, in saliency based method, you, you do it as an afterthought, right? You just say, okay, here's my model. Let me see what, what, uh, what I can explain with it, with it. Here we want really our gradient to be meaningful. So we'll have to do an extra work, which is in the next slide. So instead, as I was saying, instead of the formulation with the gate and the function, so the thing is to say, let me learn a function and, and, and regularize the gradient of this function so that it is sparse. And here to the rescue, there is this notion of nonlinear sparsity. So remember, when we talked about sparsity of linear model, it was very easy. You just look at the L1 norm of a linear predictor. Now to define the nonlinear sparsity for uh, for a uh, nonlinear function, uh, there is this very nice notion of nonlinear sparsity that was defined actually uh, by Lorenzo uh, in 2013, uh, Lorenzo Sasco. So it is the number of the features such that on, the, on average, my derivatives are different from zero, right? So, I'm, so it's in a sense, if you wanna get a, 
uh, an estimate of is, is this feature useful, you need to look at expectation on the norm of the partial derivatives with respect to the input. But so far, this one is difficult to deal with because it's a, it's, it's a counting norm. So there is a, a relaxation for it that is similar to a L1, L2 norm, which is you, you, you will be isolating each coordinate alone, right? Each xj alone and taking the square root, really the norm, right? The norm of the function of the partial derivatives. So in a sense, what we want is that this WSF that is written here on the support over some distribution that will be defined uh, later that I want to be small. Is this clear? So the only difference between the usual linear sparsity and the nonlinear sparsity is that in, li in linear sparsity, it was very easy to define. Here we need to take a look at the, um, at the, um, at the partial derivatives and make sure if they are big or small. But since the partial derivatives are defined on point, we need to define things on average, right? And if, if I take away the square root, this is an issue, right? If I take the square root away, what, what happens is that now this is just a L2 norm of, uh, of the gradient, right? So I'm not, I'm not making the coordinate compete. So I want just that we see here that the square root that we have is very important to isolate each feature alone. Because if I remove it, all the features are treated equally, right? So now back to our, uh, how do we define our, uh, our feature selection? So we are looking for a function that is, that is comparing the joint distribution to the product of the marginal. We are asking the function that is making this comparison to have the notion of nonlinear sparsity we talked about. So this is the L1 equivalent of the lasso. And for stability, the equivalent of elastic net, we will add an L2 norm of the function, right? So if you put in this, uh, in this uh, the linear function, the WSF will end up being just the linear sparsity, the, the usual sparsity, right? Because the derivative of beta x is just beta j, right? So in a sense, if we put just the linear predictor that we know, uh, we know about, it's just a gradient sparsity. And in general, we will use mu to be, uh, to be just a product of marginal because it covers all the space, right? The, the product of marginal, it covers more than just the joint, this mu. Now, what do we gain out of this? So if we think about it, the, 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 the expectation of the gradient, right? Of the, of, uh, uh, of the partial derivative on a feature J will be our feature, uh, our feature importance score, right? Because at the end of the day, if I train, I can compute the, how much this feature was important or not for this nonlinear mod model, then what I gain, I'm getting also a feature important score. So now we will start to, to, to try to optimize this cost. Before I delve to it, any questions on the formulation? Yeah, yes. Um, can you can you remind me what exactly f is? I remember that it's related to the mutual information. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. So f, it's think of it just as a classifier that has that is giving plus one label to the joint distribution, right? To to the the feature, uh, the genomic features, and the response, the correct response. This is a pxy. And then px, py, it's given it minus one label. It is when you scramble the responses, right? Think of it just as a con contrastive loss that has high values on the joint because you want to really be being able to learn what is the, what is the, uh, how do you say, like, w w what does it mean to, to, to be uh, in the joint distribution, right? To define, to learn the support of the joint distribution, you are giving it negative examples around it, right? So, so how does that relate to the mutual information? Okay, so, so the, the mutual information is, um, is, is the KL distance between the joint and the product of marginals, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. the KL distance. But instead of KL, you can use any other dis distance. And what I'm saying, without the regularizer in, in blue and red, right? The green part, the soup over F, this is a distance between distributions. If, if, if PXY it was equal to PXPY, meaning they are independent, the soup is zero, right? Mm -hmm. And if they are not, 
it's, it will try to find what is the distance between them. So the, the idea here is that, that the, instead of using the complicated KL to, to compute mutual information uh, in high dimension, you cannot do it, right? So we are just using another form of measuring the distance between the joint and the product of the marginal that is easy to compute. So soup over F is the distance or F is the distance? No, so this is the full soup. The soup, okay, thank you. Yeah, so it, it, it's really, it's the full soup is the distance. And the, the parts in blue and red are just controlling the sparsity. So this is the regularization. So the main loss that is the dependency measure is the part in green. The part in blue is the part that is uh, responsible of gradient sparsity and the part in, in red on the uh, extreme right of the screen is just for stability, similar to elastic net. So now we'll, we'll turn on to how to optimize this loss and to see what is the complication in it. So the gradient penalty has expectation proceeded by a square root. So imagine now I wanna do uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent. As I get a mini batch, Right? This is an issue if I have a nonlinearity before the expectation, right? Because I, I will have always biased estimate in, inside of the square root of the expectation. So this is a, one big issue first. The other issue is that square root by itself is not smooth at zero, at zero. The derivative is discontinuous at zero. So we will show how to alleviate those issues using two tricks. So the first easy trick is that the non-smoothness at zero, just add a small perturbation epsilon, right? And let this epsilon go to zero and then things will be fine. The other issue will, will result, we need to remove the square root in some way. But as, a, uh, as I said before, the square root is very important because if it was not there, it's just a Sobolev norm. Uh, it's just like aggregating all the gradient together. So, by, by putting this square root, we are isolating each coordinate so that they compete between each other, okay? So now, in order to remove the square root, we are going to resort to another uh, variational trick that is uh, called the eta trick. So this eta trick, it, it's a very neat trick. It allows you to remove the square root at the expense of adding other auxiliary variables. Right? So remember, what we have here is just sum of square root of whatever inside, I will call it aj, and then it's raised to the power two. Right? So it is sum of square root aj raised to the power two. So this you can see, see it uh, that it, if I add other uh, uh, variables, eta j's, in this way, such that it's the sum of eight aj divided by eta j, and sum over eta j is equal to one. I will, I will get the, the, the objective that I have. So at optimum, just if you want to believe me, at optimum, what you have, it would be good if I can, is there any way to, um, to annotate? Uh, yeah, let me try that. So uh, if, I, if I take this guy, right? And I put this eta j in it, right? So it will be aj divided by square root aj, then I will get aj and everybody is multiplied by square root kaj, then I will get this guy. So in a sense, this trick, the neat, the, the neat part from it is, uh, is that I can remove this square here and square root here by, uh, by writing it this way. And what I get now, I remove the square root. That was annoying when I had expectation, okay? So let's see how, how then things work. So the way we will do it is that we will replace the square root this with this eta j and, and we will put it in the cost, right? So instead now of optimizing only on f, we'll be also optimizing on etas. And as I was telling you, the eta at the end of the day will be the square root of the expectation of the gradients uh, squared. And these are the feature importance that we care about. So in a sense here, we killed two, two birds in one stone. Right, so we, we made the optimization easy, but at the end of the optimization, eta j's are the feature important score that you care about. Is this clear? So the full trick is just to remove the square root by adding auxiliary variables that are eta j's. And eta j's are the op at the optimum are 
the square root of the expectation of each uh, partial derivatives. And these are the things we were after, the feature importance. So all together, then the method will become learning over F and eta, something that does still the green part that is like the dependency measure. The sparsity part now is just written in a different way, but it's exactly the same thing that it was before. But we, are, we added auxiliary variable we wanna optimize on. And, uh, and, uh, and another term for stability. So the, the cute thing about this trick is that it, it, at the end of the optimization, I'm left with the function, the witness function that is uh, discriminating between the joint and the product of marginal. And I have also for free each coordinate, how much it is important as encoded by those eta j's. And uh, the full optimization is then uh, over the function f, over the etas. f is in a functional space. We haven't yet talked about what it is. And eta j, it's, uh, it's just a probability, right? So in a sense, eta j at the end of the day is an attention, right? It's an attention that sums to one. And if you, if you rank it, you will get like how much each feature is important. And now if I have samples, if I have samples, I just replace all the expectation by the empirical, uh, by the empirical uh, estimations of the expectations. And I can solve this problem. Now, if this was an RKHS, F, if it was an RKHS, it happens that this problem is convex in both F and eta. So in a sense, if I do alternating optimization between F and eta, I'm guaranteed to converge to the optima. Or if I do block coordinate descent, I'm also guaranteed to converge. So, so now we, 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 we started from, let me just like to, to, to summarize what we did so far. So what we did so far, we had, we redefined the feature selection via this gradient sparsity selection on a, a dependency measure. And then we replaced the gradient sparsity with a convenient way that allows us to get immediately feature important score from those eta j. And then we can solve this problem empirically by specifying what is the function class. And, uh, uh, and now we will delve to some theory just about like to try to understand what is this uh, independence criterion once the function class is in a KHS. So the, the, if this function class was an RKHS, here I'm writing it in a finite dimensional RKHS, but it's, it's true also for infinite dimensional. So what we get is that, uh, remember, so you can think about this one as the green part as being the objective and the blue and, the gr and red part as being constraints, right? So in RKHS, in most of the cases, the optimum happens when the objective meets the constraints. So this is very nice for the, the interpretability of the feature selection method that we have because the, the value of the object of, the, of SIC decomposes in terms of uh, those feature important scores. So as you see, SIC of PXY, PXPY is equal to, uh, is proportional to the, to the sum of the contribution of each feature. So in a sense, the difference between a regular mutual information and this type of uh, measuring the, the dependency is that it's a granular. So I can read out from it how much each feature contributed to this uh, mutual information. It's still global dependency, but it's a granular in the way that I can read out which feature, how much is contributed from, and I can just see it from uh, the eta j. Now we can also extend this to not only dealing it as if it was uh, an LKHS, we can do it also if it was a neural network, right? So, uh, so this is what I was saying. It's a form of mutual information. So mutual information is not the correct term. I should say a dependency measure that uh, decomposes uh, in terms of the contributions of the coordinate. And it's interpretable because then I can read, read those out um, in terms of which one uh, it contributed. If I was in RKHS, um, the problem happens to be jointly convex and alternating optimization on the function and the eta works. Or if I do just the gradient descent on the function and the gradient descent on the eta, 
And remember, eta is a, it lives on a simplex, right? It needs to sum to one. So if I do gradient descent, I need to be doing mirror descent. So if we were doing it with a neural network, so the choice will be to do stochastic gradient, right? So we'll learn the function f by, uh, as a neural network, and then we will update its parameter by just gradient descent. Um, then for updating the etas, right, that as the feature important score, we have just to do it via, via mirror descent, which is, if you want, you just like do uh, the computation in the logit space, then you use softmax to bring it back to become a probability, right? So you do the update, the regular update of a gradient descent on the logits, then you push it through, through, the, uh, through the softmax. So this is, this is basically the algorithm that we, we will be using, the, what we refer to as neural SIC, which is we will be alternating between learning a neural network that's trying to discriminate between the joint distribution and the scrambled distribution, if you want, like the associating the, the product of marginals. And then we will also update the feature importance score by, by, by doing the logics. So do you have any, any question before I, I move to the second part of the talk? So, so far we are, we, we are just, we have a method that's able to give us feature importance scores that are uh, discovering nonlinear relationships between the X and the Y. So, so now, I'm going to move to the other part of the talk where we want to use those feature important score to control the force discovery rate. So how do we do it? So, so, so far we, are, we, we, we trained a method, for example, that gets us a critic function, the function that is discriminating between the joint and the product of the marginals. And we have, it produces for us also feature important score eta j. We could just like say, okay, I will rank those eta j's and I will keep the first 50 or the first 60 or the first 70 features as being the most important feature. But to set this threshold is very arbitrary if I do that, right? So we need a principled way in order to say like when I should say this is important versus not important. And this is where usually typically we, you're familiar with the permutation tests, right? So we need to do permutation tests in order to, to tell if a feature is important or not. So as we will see um, uh, uh, in the next slide, permutation tests that consist in just taking a column of features and permuting it uh, across the individual. It will fail and I will, I will explain why. So typically what we want to know is a feature J and dependent from the response Y given all the other coordinates, right? So this is the null hypothesis that we wanna test. So I want to know if a feature J is responsible of the response conditioned on all the other features, yes or no, right? So this is equivalent to saying my joint distribution of X and Y decouples this way. The coordinate XJ depends on all the other coordinate that is noted here via X minus J. And Y only depends on all the other coordinates uh, X minus J. So we want to test if this holds true or not, right? So if I, the problem is that I don't have access to those things, X, J, given all the other coordinates. What permutation tests do, it ignores that you don't have this one. And it says, okay, all the features are independent. So to generate from X, J, uh, given all the other features, I just randomly permute the the, the feature J uh, in my population. So this is wrong, right? Because th the coordinate might be dependent. And in most cases in practice, the coordinates are dependent. The features are dependent. So permutation tests are uh, fail whenever your features are dependent. And in order to do, to do proper uh, statistical testing for uh, conditional independence, you need to be able to generate a coordinate xj given x minus j. In practice, we don't have those, but these days we have a lot of powerful generative models, right? To, to be able to, ge to generate such distribution, xj given x minus j. So the way we will do it, we'll train a generative model to given all the other feature except j to predict the feature j, right? So this is now a conditional uh, model that can be trained easily. 
So now, given that we have those conditional uh, generative models, and that we have uh, uh, and that we have uh, the, the feature importance model and uh, the function that I was talking about uh, in SIC, uh, how can we uh, control for false discovery? So the method goes this way. So you take a hold out set. This is the reality. This is how like the data is. It is like uh, I have those uh, genomic feature. I have this response. Now you want to simulate the hypothesis H0 that you want to test, right? So you take all your other coordinate and you generate the scenario where the coordinate J does not, the response does not depend on the coordinate J via your, via your uh, generator, right? So you create a fake set by generating how it would look under this hypothesis H0. Now this F was the one that I was talking about that was trained from, uh, from, uh, from our Sobolev independence criteria, right? So it was trained to have high value on the reality and it should have low values on the not reality, right? This guy. So now we have a method to compute, to start to compute P values and do proper statistical testing. So the way we will do it is that we take the whole outset, this is the reality. This is the fake reality that we want to test if, uh, if reality is, is similar to it or not, right? So that's why I was saying it's a, it's a, so F is kind of doing some distance computation. It's not F, it's the average of F minus the average of F, right? It's the soup at the end. So we, we, we draw, we, we do one first uh, set and we get the mean of the function F over the whole outset and we get the mean of the same function f on the fake set, right? And we do this for a bunch of uh, 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 simulation of the, of the reality. Usually, you, when you do permutation test, you just simulate the reality by just permuting those coordinates here. And as we said, it's strong if your features were independent. And then we compute p-values, and p-values are how many times after doing this uh, sampling of uh, the hypothesis set H0 for n times. So remember, f was trained to have high values on the reality and low values on the non-reality. So we are counting how many times the fake, the fake scenario I've been uh, simulating is higher than the real scenario. Then I get those p-values, I feed them to a very well-studied uh, uh, statistical uh, for multi-hypothesis testing, and I accept or reject if a feature is important or not. So in a sense, by doing this full pipeline, we are guaranteeing that, so benjamini hochberg procedure takes a FDR target, like the force discovery target that you want to set it at, and then you accept or reject on it. So this is a full pipeline if you want to, to be able to, uh, to guarantee that you are selecting the feature selection under some target false discovery rate. And this is important in practice. So this is one, one example. This is a synthetic example where, where you have a, this very complicated nonlinear function uh, between y and x. And your x is 50 dimensional. And to make it even more difficult, we make all the coordinates correlated with correlation rule uh, 0 0.5. But y depends only on the first six coordinates in this nonlinear way. And we want to see uh, how the other methods uh, do with, and how our method does. So at the very first thing here, we have elastic net that is just a linear model. So in all of those methods, we are doing, we are using the same method that I was describing to control the false discovery. So the false discovery rate is controlled at uh, 0 0.1 here. And, <clears throat> and, and uh, if we use elastic net, as you see, the false discovery rate is well controlled, but this is just thanks to the whole out randomization test, meaning that this method works to control the false discovery rate, but it takes a hit in the true positive, right? So because it's a linear method, it won't be able to find all the correct uh, uh, relationship or, or all the correct coordinates responsible of the variable. So it takes a hit. Random forests, for example, the holdout randomization test using the generative models, et cetera, that we talked about, is going also to be controlling the false discovery rate. It will have better true positive rate than, the, than elastic net. 
And by the way, those boxes are averaged on ma many data set that just to show that the method is robust or not robust with respect to multiple tests where, we are, where you are doing the, the trainings. So now if we go to our method that has two instances, so we see that the, the false discovery rate is, 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 is controlled, but at the same time, we still have a very high true positive rate, which is thanks to the representative power of uh, neural networks, right? So you are able to capture very nonlinear dependencies thanks to the representation power of neural networks. So you have very high still true positive rate and your false discovery rate is controlled thanks to the whole statistic, statistical pipeline that we talked about. So this is all nice and cute in the synthetic experiments because like we know exactly what is reality, right? Like what are the, the important features? In reality, we don't know, right? So it's, it's, it's a harder game in reality to, to, to know if a method is doing well or not. Uh, because here we know x1 to x6 are responsible of it. So this is a bad test to see if the method is worth it or not. So the other real data set we've been using here is the drug response on, uh, in the cancer cell line encyclopedia. So this is, you want to see um, the, how the, the anti-cancer drug response with respect to genomic features from, uh, from cell lines. So again, here, here the problem is that we don't know uh, what are the true responsible features. So what we, will, what we do here is that we see how much a drop there is an error once we select those features using, for example, a neural network model or using a random feature, number, uh, a random forest uh, uh, method. So, so what you see is that that uh, on, on average, so in, in, in this case, if your predictor was a neural network, for, uh, for, for, the, for just to see after you selected, if you still can explain your response. Elastic net here seems to be performing better in terms of uh, MSE. If we use random features, uh, sorry, random forests, then you will see that our method will perform better. And we have similar, similar thing on HIV. And, uh, and here we, we also like, achieve better uh, through positive while controlling the false discovery. So this is yet another data set with a similar flavor. And uh, thank you for your attention. <clears throat> and if you want, we <clears throat> the code for the paper and for all the experiments uh, is available online. And you, you can <clears throat> with uh, both the false discovery control and the feature selection. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat> thank you, Youssef. Um, <clears throat> Questions? Uh, so I have a question about this beta trick. Yeah. Um, I'm, your assuming, name. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming this only works if you're not taking any you know, derivatives of this expression or anything like this. Okay, can you repeat? I'm assuming this trick only works really if you're not then doing any derivatives on top of this or anything like that, no? Or you're taking no, no, it, it, it works because it's you're just uh, remember so here here it's soup of f right you're just replacing the the omega s f with its equivalent that is inf and then you just pull out the soup so it's soup of and eta okay so well let's say that i would try like I, I like this trick and i would like to apply it somewhere else yeah i'm, a, I'm assuming it only works if i do this kind of soup or internal operations yes yeah 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 yeah, yeah. So, so by, by the way, this was like first introduced in a paper by Pontil, uh, by Massey, Massey Pontil. And then it was used later on in uh, like to deal with L1 and L2 or with um, uh, L1, L2 norms or with, uh, uh, with uh, multiple kernel learning. So, it's, so it, here we, we just used it and it happened that it, it was nice because it ended up being the feature importance scores. Thank you. And there is a very nice blog post by Francis Bach explaining this ETA trick. I think he did it. Let me show you this one, Francis Bach uh, blog post. If you want to read more about this one. So this is the, this is a very nice, I recommend this very nice blog post from Francis Bach on it. I mean, we did the work before he publicized it. Just 
I mean, it's, 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 this was popular back in the uh, group sparsity days, so it's not, 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 not new. Thank you. Yousef, has been, have um, people already been using the software? Um, I'm not sure if it was been used, but like we, we put it online and I don't know if it's been widely used, but uh, we would like like if any, especially people like in, uh, in, in, in biology or bioinformatics, like to get feedback if this is, uh, if, because like that, ch the, that choice of most people is random forest in this domain, because like there is a very well designed uh, packages, et cetera, for this. So we would be curious for like uh, using it in, yeah. in much real scenarios with uh, like really high dimensional data where random forest excel. Yeah, but for instance at IBM, internally, is there a goal, you know, a, a need to use something like this or, or not? So we, we, the, the, like we, have a, we have also a lot of people that are like doing uh, genomics work inside the IBM. I see. Okay. We haven't yet reached out, but, uh, but like we have in, in our department, there is a big theme on, inter on interpretability. So th this was folding under interpretability. In, in yeah, I see. Yeah. But in order to be useful, I think it should be applied on really large uh, genomics data to see how it compares to random forest. Yeah. Really, random forests are very hard to beat on this kind of tasks. What about uh, kind of big data coming from the web? Any applications there? Yeah, there are people also do this. They, 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 I think, think like they also use random forests on it. Like you take all the logs, right? This will be very, very big vectors and you want to know, do some feature selections to, 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 to do it on it. Uh, mainly people there, I think they use linear models. Okay. Because they are very fast, easy to train. Yeah, yeah. We also have a question from Gleb Zarin uh, on the chat window. Gleb, are you able to ask your question? Sure. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Could you tell one more time uh, how we can generate XG? Uh, Conditionally? Yeah. Yeah. So here, here what I said is that we did, we, we did, we, we trained conditional generative models. So we would, we would feed a one hot vector to which coordinate we want. This is how it was trained. So we quantize all the features and we train the model to predict the bins of like the quantizations. And then we mask a feature uh, J and then we put a one hot to J and all the layers here had conditional batch norm. And the goal of this model is to predict the feature J here. Yeah. So it's a one model conditioned on a feature. It should predict, given the other features, the, the feature J. You can train it using a GAN, using a VAE. We just trained it with cross entropy here. Yeah. Does this answer your question? Yes, yeah, thank you. And one more question. Uh, is, uh, if I understand it correct, you set up alpha before, so you can control how important should be a feature using your statistical test. Yeah, so, so yeah, the statistical test, it uses, it uses the function f, right, that was trained to be, to, be, uh, uh, to, be, uh, to be sparse, right, in terms of the features. So actually, and then, and then this function is, is used, uh, these are the p-values, right? So here we were using in this version the function f. So typically imagine that you have 10,000 features. So the way then you wanna, you wanna know, I wanna keep like 200 or 100. First we rank them with respect to eta, and then we apply only this statistical test on the top, top 100. So there are, two, there are two steps. The first step is you rank them with respect to eta, because you don't wanna apply this test on the 10,000 feature, otherwise it's very computationally expensive. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. All right. Very good. Okay, great. Thanks Thank a lot, you. Yousef. Thank you, uh, Tony. And thank we you can see you again and maybe not virtually. <laughs> I hope so. Soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Keep safe to everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye.